Hello! In this video, we're going to talk about study designs, more specifically observational studies. And uh, it's in statistics, it's really important to not only be clear about what your research question is, um, but understand how to properly collect data. And then once you have, you know, cases to work with, what do you going to do with them? You know, uh, is it an observational study that you're thinking of designing or maybe even a uh, experiment? You're interested in some type of causal effect. Um, so understanding the type of uh, study design, really, really important um, because again, the whole goal in all of this is to try and answer that original research question. So there are a couple different types of ob observational studies we'll uh, look at. One is a retrospective study, and then another is a prospective study. So we'll look at kind of characteristics of each, and maybe some limitations. And then um, we'll brush upon this idea why causation cannot be inferred by um, in an observational study. Why can't we make these causal conclusions? All right, so I was combing the internet uh, a little a while ago. This has been maybe a year or two. And um, I'm you know, trying to find something that's interesting that I can create a lecture about when it comes to observational studies. And so, you know, the, I obviously must have been a little hungry because I came across this website that in very scary, you know, big letters um, screamed out cancer causing combination milk and Oreo cookies. And so, you know, this kind of got my attention. I re uh, read a little bit further. Um, if you want to check it out yourself, this is the website that I was looking at. Now, this article claims that Oreos are the most popular cookie, um, is often consumed with milk. I'll let you in on a little secret. This is probably one of my favorite uh, types of goodies, um, milk and Oreo cookies. Oh, I just love them. Anyway, so this article goes on to say, no joke, if you are consuming excessive amounts of Oreo cookies to feed the food addiction and washing it down with high fat laden, uh, high fat milk laden with hormones and antibiotics, you are creating a lethal blend that greatly increases your risk of cancer, obesity, and diabetes. Now, I read that and I think, my goodness, that is a dramatic sentence. But it also got me thinking that, you know, here we are looking at this combination of milk and cookies. And, you know, granted, they don't necessarily say that eating milk and cookies is causing cancer or obesity or diabetes. Certainly this, you know, intense, dramatic use of words um, is kind of hinting at that. And so, you know, we'll use this just as a motivational example, but I always want to sort of promote really critically thinking about the conclusions that you read, especially when it comes to the internet, um, you know, and, and really be thoughtful of, you know, can they make this kind of a conclusion based off of the data that they are supposedly basing it off of? All right, so again, we're just gonna go ahead and use this milk and cookies example as um, as a like a motivational example. So let's get the uh, our head wrapped around the variables that are in the mix. So consuming large amounts of Oreos and milk, um, that's one of the things that the researchers are believing it might explain rates of developing cancer and so on. So since we believe that consuming large of large amounts of Oreos and milk might explain cancer, uh, developing cancer, we'll call this our explanatory variable. And developing cancer, we'll just sort of focus that on that um, as our as we move through this lesson. That is going to be considered our response. All right, so if researchers were really interested in targeting, you know, this uh, relationship or explaining this relationship, we would think of milk and cookies as an explanatory variable, developing cancer that, you know, is thought to uh, be in response to the explanatory. So we'll consider that our response variable. All right, so suppose we were interested in determining if the combination of milk and Oreo cookies really does cause cancer, right? That's you know, the, at the heart of our question, does this combination of food cause cancer? 
But what kind of study would we have to actually design? All right. You think an experiment? Because that's what I'm thinking. Absolutely. Now we'll talk a, a little bit more about how uh, causal conclusions cannot be drawn from observational studies or at least one or two observational studies. Um, and I'll save that towards the end. But yes, if you want to cause, uh, make a causal conclusion, like does milk and cookies really cause cancer? We've got to design an experiment. <clears throat> All right. So if we were to design an experiment around this, um, we would have to randomly, randomly assign some adults to consume large amounts of Oreo cookies and milk. Um, we would then have to randomly assign others to completely stay away from that combination completely. Uh, we would then determine of those that were in the milk and cookies group, how many of them develop cancer and um, if that was at a higher rate than those that stayed away from it, right? Because that's what we would have to do for an experiment if we were to design a, an experiment. All right, big question. Is that an ethical study? Is that a good thing to do? Hey, would you sign up for that? Hey, come on down to Bob's uh, experiment. We are uh, trying to figure out if milk and cookies gives you cancer. So um, you guys will eat the combination. You guys won't. And we'll see what happens. Yeah, definitely not ethical. No, no, no. All right. So... The reason why I even bring this up is that sometimes researchers might want to answer this kind of question, right? Is the combination of milk and cookies ca causing some types of cancer? Well, the, we can't design an experiment around that. So observational studies are the thing that we will have to uh, rely on. Now, there are some limitations, and so we might not be able to really get at this, you know, does X cause Y conclusion that we want, but we can get pretty close. Um, years and years of studies, if they come up with the same sort of conclusion, you know, with all of this evidence, we might be able to say that there really is sort of this causal link. That's why you hear, uh, you know, smoking causes lung cancer. It's because years and years and years of studies all point to the same thing. So finally, they're able to make this conclusion. Off of one observational study, though, we still won't be able to make that causal conclusion. All right, so now that we know we have to design an observational study, experiment is kind of out of the question for this example, um, we have two different types of observational studies that we could design. One is called a retrospective study. So in a retrospective study, the response variable is identified first. That's essentially controlled for. So many people with... Um, some disease, so many people without, that's, you know, identified. But then the researchers look back into their history and maybe measure some risk factors. All right, so looking for looking in the past for risk factors, here's this researcher kind of, you know, at the start of the study, <clears throat> identifying the response and then looking back. I think, you know, retro, looking back, that sort of thing. Whereas a prospective study, researchers identify risk factors. This is the explanatory variable. And then they follow them for a period of time. All right. So we're kind of moving forward. Um, you know, it might be that they record all the information there. But essentially, a prospective study means that we have these individuals. We measure the explanatory variable, however they fall. And then we see what happens. Um, again, in a retrospective study, there is sort of this control over um, identifying people based on the response variable first, um, because I can guarantee that I'll get so many people with the disease and so many people without. All right, so here we have two different types of descriptions. Let's identify which is a prospective and which is a retrospective study. So we're trying to decide which one of these sort of fits into those two categories. So at this point, I would encourage you to pause the video, uh, read this over on your own, form your own ideas, and then come back and then uh, listen to my explanation. All right, welcome back. So I hope that you have your own thoughts about this. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and read this first 
description, uh, it says that we have a sample of adults. We identify which of the adults have cancer. For those who have cancer, we classify them according to their prior Oreo milk consumption. Uh, same for those without. So in this one, what I'm seeing is that cancer is our response variable. And we identify people um, that have cancer. Right. And then obviously we would have to identify um, those that don't as well. And so for those that have cancer, we classify them according to their prior Oreo milk consumption. So we're looking back and kind of identifying, you know, do they eat a lot of milk and Oreos or not so much? So because we identify the response and then look back to classify them based on the explanatory variable, this is a retrospective study. Uh, we have uh, the next uh, uh, description. We have a sample of adults. We classify them based on their milk and Oreo consumption habits, follow them for the next 10 years to, dis to determine who has developed cancer. All right, so the following them for a period of time, that sort of gives away the prospective study. And so also we've got adults and just kind of classify them based on milk and Oreos. So that would be a prospective, prospective study. All right. All right, so some comments and limitations. Retrospective studies, um, there is an increased risk of confounding variables in these retrospective studies. The reason for that is, you know, often we're having to measure um, some type of explanatory variable based on someone's past um, or something to that effect. And so maybe they don't really know how many milk and cookie um, sessions they've had in the last month, year, two years, something like that. Um, the other, you know, fun fact I like to call it is that if a retrospective study was performed, researchers can only look at the odds ratio as far as um, statistical inference. Um, so there really is this kind of limitation, and that's because of the increased risk of confounding variables. Now, um, this isn't in any of your reading, at least for this course, but uh, I just wanted to kind of bring this to your attention that based on the study design, you do have, you know, some rules to follow as far as your conclusions go. So the odds of success are just the proportion of successes in your study over the proportion of failures. So this kind of gives you a, a sense of uh, what's the, you know, the the chances of having a success relative to the chances of having a failure. You know, are you twice as likely to encounter a, a success compared to a failure? Now the odds ratio would be just the odds for one group compared to the other. And so when it comes to the time where you have to make a statistical um, conclusion, it can only be on this odds ratio. Odds ratios, I don't know about you, they're not really intuitive to me. Uh, they they take some some really thinking about for sure, and um, and so with that being said, in considering these kinds of limitations, do you think it's important to understand how the study was designed before making a larger uh, a conclusion? Like yeah, absolutely, super important to know how the study was designed, because if a retrospective study was designed. Um, and I see some researcher, you know, just comparing proportions. Well, I know that that's not appropriate. One nice uh, thing that retrospective studies can offer is what if you're studying some really, really rare disease? Well, if you just randomly sample, you know, adults from some population, if your disease only happens at a 1% rate, well, then, you know, in a sample of 30 or 40 adults, you might not get anybody with this disease. Whereas a retrospective study, you're able to control for that a, a bit. You can get you know, a certain number of individuals and identify them uh, and then uh, identify them based on you know, their, they, them having the disease or not. 
And then you can go, you know, back and, and take the measurements that are appropriate to your study. So it does offer that additional element of control, making sure that you get someone with some disease or make sure that you get, you know, at least some individuals that um, are, you know, have some, you know, um, characteristic that you're looking for. But, uh, but again, there are some drawbacks as well. Now with prospective studies, these are much more popular, um, easier to design. You get more flexibility with the kinds of analyses you can run on data from prospective studies. You are able to reduce some of those possible confounding variables because you're either measuring the response variable um, yourself um, or you're measuring some explanatory variable, you're recording information as time goes on. You are able to compare simply the differences in proportions of successes. Um, you can also compare the odds ratio or the odds as well. So you do have, you know, more tools that you can use when it, a prospective study has been decide, uh, designed. So when you hear, you know, quote, observational study, it's probably a prospective study if, you know, you had to take a guess. Retrospective studies are not as um, popular, mostly because of those limitations. Now, I said this word a time or two, confounding variable. What exactly is that? Well, a confounding variable is a variable that has an influence on the response, but its effect on the response cannot be distinguished between or distinguished from the effects of the explanatory variable. So in other words, here I have a response variable. I'm pretty sure the explanatory variable might be influencing it, but this other confounding variable could be as well. And I don't really know which variable is, is changing the response. Is it the explanatory? Is it this confounding variable? It's really hard to tell. I can't distinguish the effects um, on the response between these two variables. So the term controlling for confounding variables is used. So controlling for um, really just means that I'm accounting for that confounding variable or I'm measuring that confounding variable if I can even identify it. Sometimes I can't identify it and it's just going to be part of my study. This is why we cannot make causal conclusions that the explanatory variable is causing changes in the response because for a confounding very for an observational study, excuse me, um, I can control for some confounding variables, but certainly not all of them. Uh, experiments offer me some addi additional control, and that's where we're able to make those causal conclusions. All right, so here's a question we can practice identifying what type of study was designed. So in one study, looking at obesity and cardiovascular disease, um, a little over 3,000 women uh, years ago were classified as obese or not according to their weight um, divided by the square uh, the square the square it's misspelled that one uh, <laughs> typo sorry about that um, anyway they were classified as either obese or not these women were followed for a number of years and the number of women in each category who died from cardiovascular disease was recorded all right, so it looks like they were classified based on their weight, um, obese or not, and they had some classification for that. So weight is one variable, and then it looks like dying from cardiovascular disease, that is another variable that they're measuring. But since they identified individuals based on weight, which we would consider an explanatory variable, dying from cardiovascular disease, that would be our response. Doesn't this sound like a prospective study, right? They were, these women were followed for a period of time. Prospective study is what we've got going on. Certainly not an experiment at all because we did not randomly assign these women to any type of treatment group. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for listening. Tune in for a video on experiments.